Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SASB Standards 101, Integrating SASB into your ESG strategy. My name is Joy Meredith, and I'm a Customer Success Manager at Gobi. The Value Reporting Foundation SASB Standards are quickly becoming an integral part of decision-making and reporting process globally for investors and companies. The ESG reporting landscape is growing and developing, and investor attention is gravitating towards SASB Standards. Today's webinar is in the first of a two-part series on the SASB Standards. In today's session, we'll examine how SASB standards help businesses around the world identify, manage, and communicate financially material ESG information to their investors. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be distributed to everyone after the session. Second, this webinar will run about 45 minutes or so, and we'll save about five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. If you have any questions during this webinar, you can submit them during the questions section in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll attempt to answer as many questions as possible, but if we don't get to them all, members of our team will follow up with you after the webinar and provide you with answers. Third, as I mentioned, today's, the, today's session is the first of two webinars about the SASB standards. Make sure to keep an eye out over the next few weeks and we'll invite you to register for part two. Okay, now that we've covered those, let's introduce, introduce today's speakers. First, we have Ryan Soon as the SASB Standards Integration Manager at the Values Reporting Foundation. Welcome, Ryan. Next, we have Carlos Solano. He is an ESG Manager at Gobi. Hello, Carlos. Thank you, and Joy. And we have Kylie Ford. She is a Principal ESG Consultant at Gobi. And with that, let's get started. Ryan, why don't you take us away? Sounds good. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for having me here. Really excited to uh, be able to present for Gobi on this event today. And uh, Really just going to start with an overview of the SASB standards and uh, how you can start to think about them and apply them into your work. And so the SASB standards, we put forward 77 industry specific disclosure standards tailored for companies to report their ESG performance to investors on the subset of sustainability issues that are likely to have a financial impact industry by industry. And so we've seen a wide range of adoption globally. Uh, we started, of course, in the States, but uh, have grown very quickly and uh, have seen significant uptake around the globe, particularly in Europe and Asia, as well as developing markets over the past few years. So just a metric here in that, you know, we recently reached the significant benchmark for us of 1 million standards down. I lost you for a second. It's... All right, we might have lost Ryan for a quick sec. All right, where we go? Yeah, I think I'm back. Sorry for my poor Wi-Fi here. Um, You're fine, let's keep going. You're good. Okay, sorry, to the right point of this global adoption. Um, I, sorry, apologies, I think I've skipped a few slides. So let me get back on track. Okay, apologies for that. So uh, to this point of the corporate adoption, many leading firms are now utilizing the SASB standards to guide their investor communications. You'll see significant brands here, such as Ford, Delta, Gap, LG, Travelers, Nike, so on and so forth. But really across the globe, what we're seeing is a significant uptick in corporate adoption and utilization of the SASB standards for these group sustainability reportings. Uh, particularly in the past uh, two years uh, from 2020 to 2021 and into 2022, we're expecting another significant uptick in growth. Notably, uh, more than half of the S&P 1200 index, global 1200 index, now reports the SASB standards. And so here's just a breakdown of that S&P 1200 index sort of region by region across these significant markets. So you can get a sense of just how companies across the globe are really being drawn to the SASB standards for that communication to investors so they can clearly communicate how they're managing their ESG performance. And it's more than just corporates as well. We're seeing significant support and adoption from investors. The groups here that you see on this slide are what we call our investor advisory group. This is a group of 57 leading asset owners and asset managers across the globe representing more than $48 trillion in assets and management, 
who utilize the SASB standards in their investment analysis and actively encourage companies to use the SASB standards in their communication to investors. And the SASB standards have been, uh, have been validated by external research. We, of course, have the very famous study by Khan, Serafim, and Yoon uh, from Harvard Business School that came out years back, um, as well as the second research building off that by Russell Investments, showing that portfolios that actively manage and actively uh, utilize material issue issues in their decision-making process generate a higher four-factor alpha. And in the second webinar that Gobi will be hosting in a few weeks, my colleague will be diving deeper into sort of in a practical application and how investors can utilize the SASB standards to really uh, generate these increased returns. And so how does this all work? What, what, has, what about the SASB standards has drawn both corporates and investors? And what differentiates, differentiates the SASB standards? First, the SASB standards focus on the subset of financially material issues, meaning that uh, the sustainability issues that have a history of financial performance. They're also decision useful and they're crafted to be able to be utilized for investment making or business making decisions, and they're cost effective to report to. They're also industry specific, recognizing that ESG risks manifest themselves differently from industry to industry, and they're evidence based and market informed within our standard setting process is extremely transparent and relies very heavily on pre-existing data as well as market consensus. And so we organize our standards through a subset of 77 unique industry specific industries, again, emphasizing that we recognize that sustainability issues and sustainability materiality manifest itself very differently from each industry. And of course, again, these are, are the SASB standards are meant to be a uh, part of entire sort of reporting ecosystem for uh, investors, both as a combination of your typical financial accounting standards in cohesion with the SASB standards so that uh, investors can receive a full picture on how a company is performing financially. And talking about this financial materiality as part of our standard setting process, there's this very heavy focus on this financial materiality and that for any sustainability issue to be considered material in our standard setting process, it must have a history of being tied to a direct financial impact. So talking about health and nutrition and processed foods, an example, having a driver into demand for core products and services, which then has an impact on a company's revenue, uh, energy efficient chemicals and production, having a driver on operational efficiency and, co efficiency and cost structure, then having an impact on cost. So our work very, our research work in this process very heavily focuses on identifying those key, very specific uh, impacts before those topics are labeled as financially material. And so we organize our thinking into five broad sustainability dimensions, separate out in environment, social capital, human capital, business model innovation, and leadership and governance. And then split out further into these 26 general issue categories, which you can think of as your typical ESG themes, such as your GHG emissions, water management, workforce health and safety, et cetera, et cetera. And so these represents the full range of your typical ESG themes that are covered within the SASB standards and are identified as whether or not they are likely to be material across these seven, seven industries. And so in this slide, I really just want to emphasize yet again that this standard setting process that we have for the SASB standards is really bringing together market consensus, is really bringing together the best of the ESG thinking in the market, in that we present these sustainability issues and we decide through research whether there is evidence of financial impact. If so, we put it up to the market uh, for input for their feedback on what these standards and what the metrics to track to represent these metrics, to represent these topics should look like vetting that evidence as well as multiple iterations of public comment revision uh, again really just the SASB standards are ultimately a brought together and very heavily rely upon market consensus and so this yet again is showing just how much feedback we've received from the market over time throughout our standard setting process 
hundreds of consultants, consultation periods with hundreds of companies, multiple consultations with multiple institutional investors, and, and deep conversations with multiple industry and trade associations. So really, the entire spectrum of the market has been involved with the SASB standard setting process. And then also the SASB standards are highly complementary. We think of the this entire ESG reporting landscape as building blocks towards one cohesive reporting system. And that GRI focuses very heavily on uh, information that is relevant to all stakeholders, including investors, while SASB standards focus on the financially material and industry specific data uh, that is tailored specifically to communications with investors. And so these really together can form uh, a extremely strong cohesive building block approach to a cohesive reporting landscape. As well as the SASB standards enable robust TCFD implementation. Uh, and so utilizing the SASB standards and reporting to the SASB standards enables a company uh, to uh, meet and report to the TCFD recommendations. And so really last topic from my end is that with, as we to talk about uh, the SASB standards cohesiveness with other reporting frameworks, it's a great transition to talk about the announcement at COP26 last year. And with that, the IFRS Foundation announced three things. First is the formation of the International Sustainability Standards Board. Second is the consolidation of CDSB and the Value Reporting Foundation into one singular organization and the publication of climate and general disclosure requirements so that the market can get a sense of where we are starting with our baseline for the formation of the ISSB standards. And so why do we agree to this merger? Why do we decide to go through this consolidation process? It was really, the goal was to simplify the landscape. There was a demand that we heard from the market for, for rationalization and simplification and to bring together this alphabet soup into one continuously evolving in cohesive ESG reporting landscape and to combine the resources and the relationships that we all have throughout the globe to simplify this field. In with, in with that, the ISSB and the International Sustainability Standards Boards, their role in this is to really develop a global baseline of sustainability disclosure standards that focus on meeting the information needs, the sustainability information needs of investors allowing companies to provide comparable, consistent, and reliable sustainability information. And again, continuing this building block approach to facilitating the requirements necessary for a jurisdiction-specific jurisdiction uh, reporting system. And so what does that mean for the SASB standards? For those utilizing it uh, and for those reporting to it or utilizing their investment work or creating services around it, the SASB standards are going to form the baseline of what we will begin to assess for the ISSB industry-specific disclosure requirements. And as the standard setting process continues over the next two, three years, these will evolve based on market feedback. And so, again, SASB standards as well as the TCFD recommendations and our other work in the integrated reporting framework will be our starting point and will evolve as we receive comments and feedbacks and recommendations from the market. And lastly, from my end, in the short term, really there's no change for those of you utilizing the SASB standards. There's no change in how we support the SASB standards. There's no change to how we support groups like Gobi and their work, which we're very proud to do. In the medium term, we will continue to evolve the ISSB standard setting process and we'll be looking for market feedback on that work. And so very heavily encourage you to keep in touch with us to weigh in when you see opportunities to do so as really the more feedback we receive throughout the standard survey process, the more robust, the stronger the ISSB framework ends up being. And then a the long term, again, really aiming for this uh, consistent cohesive ESG reporting landscape that is suitable for jurisdictional adoption across the globe. And with that, and that's pretty much all from my end. I'll hand it over to um, Carlos and happy to answer any questions when we move into the Q&A session. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. All right, so how do we actually go about using SASB, whether we're a corporation, an investor? Um, so for the sake of brevity in our time together, I will focus on a very specific metric, but the way we get to that metric, we'll see, uh, is just kind of two ways of going about it. So 
Uh, let's just think of company X, as a fund manager, and we manage $2 billion in assets under management. We have about 30 employees, and we have this current strategy with fund A1 of buying companies in the healthcare sector that have about five to $15 million in EBITDA. What do we want to use SASB? What do we want to use SASB for? Well, we have two main goals. One would be, there it is. Goal one would be to engage with those portfolio companies that we're deploying capital to. And number two is to respond to uh, DDQs that are coming in or due diligence questionnaires from investors. So the main takeaway before we move on is to see the flexibility of SASB that contrary to uh, some may believe that you're kind of stuck with your industry and that's what you have to do. Not necessarily. There's really a lot of versatility in using SASB, as we'll see from, from this example. So how do we identify these metrics? Well, there's a top-down approach that is probably the easiest to recognize, which would be to start with the largest uh, segmentation of the market, which would be a sector, right? So. In this case, we could be looking internally at uh, financials and more specifically asset management and custody activities. Uh, that would be the industry. But then let's focus for this example in what, how we deploy capital, which is the healthcare sector. We will read all the industry descriptions and choose the most relevant ones uh, under the healthcare sector. And then we will review the topics and all associated metrics and prioritize based on the business models of the companies that we actually have. We want to think about things like geographical reach, their customer base, whether they're integrated vertically, meaning their value chain, their suppliers, their distribution, or horizontally across business lines. Um, all of these things are, are things to consider whether we want to use all of the metrics under this industry or this um, company, or take out a few, or add a few. How do we add a few? We can use a bottom-up approach, if you will. How do we use a, a bottom-up approach? We will look at the topics, the sustainability topics, from industries that we believe will have some similar challenges. Um, granted, SASB has already spent eight years identifying what is most relevant, but you know your company's business models best. So we will see an example in the next uh, slide, but simply know that you can still search around and this is part of the flexibility of using SASB. Again, just to summarize what we just said on the previous slide, what is the scope? If we go top down, we wanna look at healthcare as a sector. And we know that we only invest in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals and also in medical equipment and supplies companies. So that's where we would start with just those two industries under this one sector. But then for bottom-up approach, if we think we have, let's say, uh, a lot of equipment and we have a lot of warehouses, so we have a, a large footprint, let's say in the US, we might want to look at the infrastructure sector and the real estate industry for potentially useful metrics that can help us track the efficiency, um, let's say on the E side of the ESG, of ESG for all of those um, buildings. On a similar, vein if we think of consumer goods and food and beverage industries we know that they have complex supply chains from sourcing across the world so we may look into what topics are there if we're sourcing also a lot of materials for our medical equipment um, use so what would this look like again sector and industry healthcare medical equipment general issue category again we're just choosing one specific one please note that there are multiple issue categories under this industry we're going to go with product design and life cycle management now there are multiple disclosure topics as ryan mentioned we have five broad dimensions um, we have nearly 30 uh, general topics and each industry has different impacts and different associated metrics with those so we're going to choose product quality and safety as the, as the topic. And there are multiple metrics under this topic. We're going to choose number of recalls issued and total units recalled. So this is one way of using SASB top-down and requesting this type of information from your portfolio companies. 
and reporting it back up to investors. Now, the other way to the bottom-up approach, let's say we also find product quality and safety in a different industry. And we, we found this one metric, total weight of packaging, percentage made from recycled and or renewable materials, and three, percentage that is recyclable, reusable, and or compostable. We found this under the product design and life cycle management category of consumer goods as the sector and household and personal products as the industry. Again, takeaway is versatility, uh, flexibility, um, pick your favorite um, word there, <laughs> but top down, bottom up, bottom up, we can find the right metrics to report on. So how do we engage um, with these portfolio companies? So there are a few strategies that we could use. We can start with the qualitative ones because this really identifies how they're approaching these topics. So it's, it's more or less an easier starting point, a ramp on to see what are they even doing? Do they have policies? Uh, some of the soft metrics, if you will, we can start asking for those. For as far as quantitative metrics, if they don't have a baseline, um, that could be uh, an opportunity to start setting uh, the expectation of what could be uh, taken as a baseline and really utilize a lot of resources from the SASB Knowledge Hub. Uh, I will specifically, specifically point out the engagement guide, which turns a lot of these metrics and a lot of this information into very actionable questions for portfolio companies. So they're organized by topic, and that is something that you can certainly leverage. For phase two, once you kind of started uh, an initial phase of engaging with portfolio companies. Really, these are more tips. Um, first of all, would be aligning to the accounting schedule. Really, they have the most, probably the, the best at collecting data and reporting it, right? So you want to align to their schedule and make sure that you're not pressing them or pushing them around reporting season. If you're in a calendar year, around the end of the year, or if you're in a fiscal year, it might be a different time. Considering a different cadence, a reporting cadence. So start annually, start collecting data annually and increase the frequency as you get more experience, uh, as your companies feel more comfortable collecting that. A, a point cross-department liaison so that people feel like they have ownership and a, a say and they can help you improve how to collect, collect data. Also, uh, what works best is really cross-pollination as some people call it, also knowledge sharing, if you will. And that means taking companies that are high performers and pairing them up, if you, if you will, with low performers and just sharing uh, best practices among them. Also, hard and soft in incentives work. So things like titles. If it's financial, consider anything from a $20 gift card or a, a coffee or a lunch all the way up to some sort of bonus tied to ESG performance or outcomes. It could be one, two, three percent of, of their bonus. Um, you can have conversations around that is what usually helps things move along a, a lot quicker. And, and simply communicate transparently on your expectations. Lastly, for that goal number two of responding to investors, what we're really trying to do is to gain control of, of your story. So the same way that they may send you a lot of DDQs, uh, try to interview investors themselves and just ask them, how are they using this data? How are they using this information? A lot of times they're still also trying to assess um, how they're going to use this information. Um, we see that a lot, we interview investors and also provide evidence of, of your efforts consider doing a, something like a materiality assessment. So if you don't have something that they're asking for, you have a defensible response of saying, well, we went through the process and we identified that this is not quite, um, quite that important to us and that's why we're not engaging in it. Um, so you can have an easier time or conversation responding to that. And uh, lastly, I'll leave you with uh, consider centralizing a lot of this information so that you can organize the kinds of topics that your investors are asking for and you can match them with what you're doing and you have a strategy of how to respond instead of um, 
maybe sometimes scrambling a little bit, trying to source answers from different parts of the organization. You have a ready-made centralized solution where you log in, you have what you need, and you send it out. Um, and I will leave you with this quote, which is uh, an old one, but never, it's always uh, relevant. You can't manage what you don't measure. So a uh, quick recap, flexibility, but top down and bottom up, and gain control of your, of your engagement and your communication story. And to go a little bit deeper into the communication side of things, I'll pass it on to Kylie. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so I just want to kind of touch on how to view, e view SASB standards in the ESG marketplace broadly, uh, continuing on some of the trends that both Carlos and Ryan was were uh, speaking to. Um, so first, you know, Ryan had mentioned the reporting ecosystem as well as its more affectionate nickname of Alphabet Soup regarding ESG standards. And that's very, very true in terms of the market for ESG data is kind of exploding right now. It seems a little difficult to navigate. I want to just help you think about where SASB fits into that broader view. So for one, uh, we have types of ESG disclosures that are published guidance, meaning these are voluntary disclosures, they're guidelines, there is a flexibility to them, uh, both Carlos and Ryan had spoken to that, uh, and these are where you're going to find the SASB standards, as well as TCFD recommendations, uh, and GRI, which is the Global Reporting Initiative, and that framework for how to organize your own CSR or ESG reports. The second type is data that's requested. Uh, so there are questionnaires. Oftentimes it is voluntary to be providing this information, but things like CDP, uh, things like Bloomberg, where, where the, the requested data is that you'd be logging in. Um, UNPRI is actually another great example of requested data from you via an annual questionnaire, uh, for instance. There is also data aggregated uh, publicly from companies with Bloomberg. And those like MSCI and Sustainalytics that aggregate and create assessments based on what's publicly available, as well as some private information uh, so that it can be sold to investors. And with the third category, what you really can do uh, for those is just make sure that you are putting forward public information that's going to be speaking to your ESG initiatives. Uh, so hopefully it's clear that when it comes to SASB standards in particular and implementing it, they're more guidelines than anything else. They're a reporting uh, tool of voluntary disclosures and they are to be utilized in a way that is effective for you. So part of that effect, um, I, I feel like half the time when I'm talking about SASB standards, I'm talking about what they're not rather than what they are. Uh, and, and this is because there's a lot of misconception about them that to SASB appropriately, you must download your standard you know, fill out all of it and then you are SASB'd. That is absolutely not how we should be approaching it and thinking about it. It's not a check the box exercise. It's not a matter of, well, I've disclosed a sufficient amount of information. You really want to make sure that your ESG market risks are aligned to the SASB metrics that you're utilizing and reporting on. And Ryan has spoken to how they really do look for evidence of financial impact for the published guidance of SASB standards, but every company is uniquely situated. And it might be the case that you would want branch out beyond one particular framework and look into other uh, guidances to download so that you can understand really the breadth of things. So for instance, if you're asking for information and thinking to yourself, I just don't understand how this is ever going to impact me, ever be a risk to me, that means one of two things. One, you might have incomplete information, in which case you would want to do a little bit deeper research on what's the you know, rationale behind this standard. Uh, why is this metric being something that we're asked for uh, and how could it benefit me? Or two, you are right. And therefore this is maybe one that you don't see as materially affecting you and you can skip it in your SASB disclosures with an explanation of why it is not material. We're gonna get a lot deeper into how to mix and match metrics, how to use the standards, how to really get the most value out of them possible in our next webinar series, uh, which is going to be a little bit more on advanced SASB. But just keep in mind that the whole point of any of these frameworks is to help you bring a new lens of risk management into what you're doing. And in the particular case of SASB, it's that intersection of ESG and financial impact. Then to continue along with what uh, Carlos was discussing, whoop, hold on. 
seems to, there we go. Communicating with investors. Uh, Carlos had mentioned a lot of really great ways to be engaging and understanding the needs. SASB standards are designed as communication tools between you and your investors. They are the most relevant party members to have this information, while you can also use it internally to understand your own financial performance through an ESG lens. So in terms of what you can do with the SASB standards, you could just provide the nice laundry list to them and, and that's that. Um, but often what we find is that investors need this contextualized as well too. So think through, are there any supplementary graphics, uh, any charts, any any trend data that you can provide that's going to help your disclosures actually make sense uh, along the lines. So for instance, let's say just very broadly speaking, one of the metrics you're collecting on is energy use. Can you contextualize that with an intensity measure? Can you you know, contextualize that by showing what elements of your business actually have the high in, uh, energy usage, whether it's a source uh, breakdown, whether it's a facility breakdown, things like that, uh, just so the investors aren't saying, oh, okay, the answer is 20,000 kilowatt hours. We don't know what that means, but you're disclosing it, so it must mean something. Um, always graphics are a great way to supplement it. Uh, tracking, this is trend data. I actually already <laughs> mentioned it because I find it so important, but how is this improving year over year? Uh, this is also where intensity metrics are helpful because you want your business to be able to grow and expand without it seeming like number has gone up, therefore it's bad. That's not what this means in an ESG context. It's really framing it and making sure you have a full understanding of what the impact is and how you are continuing to monitor impact. There's also targeting. Uh, do you have any ESG targets set if relevant? Uh, this is really important because then this can show your progress towards a target or if you've already met it, how much have you exceeded it by and is it time to set a new target? Uh, investors particularly wanna make sure that you have actionable ESG items on your list and targets are a great way to be able to orient whether or not your ESG uh, efforts are going far enough Maybe your target was way too ambitious and after three years of trend data, you see that, that's okay too. What we wanna make sure is that it's right sized and that it's going to be something that helps you in the long run. And finally, benchmarking. If data is available, look at how you're aligned to peers. Not everyone's gonna have a published SASB disclosure and that's okay, but you can look at other publicly available information made. So for instance, for all we talk about metrics, a lot of SASB standards get into qualitative information too, what policies are in place and describe what they cover. This is the kind of thing that you can easily benchmark with peers in the case that they have some of these policies publicly available. Uh, so this is the kind of thing to help you just contextualize the SASB metrics further, maybe place them in the context of a broader report, uh, and of course, a broader ESG implementation strategy, as Ryan had spoken to earlier, too. Lastly, I want to talk about one of the biggest pain points of, it's not just SASB, it's any single ESG framework, which is dealing with data gaps. Um, and I think there's often a misconception, particularly in this industry, that we're not ready to disclose this information, so therefore we just won't. And I, I'm here to tell you to not fear the data gap. Uh, that's not the best way forward. The best way forward is disclosure, even when there is a spot that you need to improve your data collection, that you have incomplete information. Uh, so the good news is that with SASB, again, they're all recommendations and guidelines. So if data quality is a concern, you do not feel comfortable providing this to investors or to the public, a disclosure can be skipped and it can be explained why it is you're skipping this. Uh, in the case of we're skipping it because we don't like the data uh, quality that we have here, you could explain why it is, what the concern is, and even an estimate of what's, what's our completeness? How much are we missing? Are we saying that it's a 100% data gap, we don't have any insight, or that we only have maybe 20% of this data and uh, to, to cover the operations in that context? Uh, providing that disclosure alone and disclosing what you don't know is a really important step forward to be able to understand more broadly your ESG impact and risks. Data gaps should be taken as a learning opportunity. This should be your immediate project set for the next year uh, when it comes to ESG. 
the, the, this is the engineer and me speaking, but what you want to do is establish a baseline as much as possible with ESG because you're never going to be able to improve your performance if you don't understand how you're actively performing now. Carlos said this in, in a, a more pithy statement, I think, than I'm able to sum it up right now. Um, but make sure that when it is an identified data gap, you can look into putting this on your to-do list. Now, part of that means assessing the root cause. Uh, not all data gaps are created equal, and it's almost never the case that it's simply, it's too much, we're too lazy, we don't feel like going through the process of collecting the data. Uh, usually, it's a, it's a matter of this data might be too costly to access. It could be a case of maybe we're just not monitoring it properly. The type of data that we need is not available with the monitoring systems that we have in place. Uh, in other cases, it might be that there's a third party who is either uncooperative or just does not collect the state themselves. So for instance, let's say you're leasing an office space and you want to know your electricity usage. Some landlords don't have that information, not just because you're not submeter, but they don't even break it down for you with a proration by square footage. That's okay, but maybe there would be something that you'd want to implement or introduce into your lease language or even look for a different office space if that's really not something you're able to wrap your arms around. That's assuming, of course, energy use is quite material to your business and something that you're going to need to understand moving forward. And then lastly, just don't sweat them. Uh, like I said, no one has sufficiently ESG'd anywhere, even best in class. This is an ever evolving market. Uh, so it is so much better to at least have some insight into what your performance is. And the SASB standards are a wonderful organizational tool for you to think through, here's what's likely to be our financial risks. Let's start there. Let's track the trend data. Let's make sure we understand what information we have in place now and what information we don't know and dig into the second bucket a little bit further. And then when it comes to communicating with our investors, we can say that this is what we want to orient our action around because we do believe there is a significant financial impact from these particular metrics. Um, so that's really about all I wanted to talk uh, broadly. More than happy to, I think we've got about 20 minutes left. Any questions you might have, we know that SASB is a uh, definitely a hot topic right now when it comes to the disclosures. Uh, so looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Kylie. We appreciate it. Okay, guys, you gave a lot of great information there. I, I know for myself, I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say about the proposed SEC regulations that got announced on Monday. So anybody jump ball, anyone who wants to um, comment on what we think that SASB would really have to offer in a, a situation like that? Ryan? I can start from our end. So, um, so this is actually very timely. We're very excited about the SEC proposal from our end, of course. Um, this has been a, you know, a long work in progress and uh, really relevant to our work with the ISSB is setting standards that are ready for broad jurisdictional adoption across the globe. Um, and so unfortunately, I don't have much beyond this sort of the, to be determined uh, as we go through the science SBA standard setting process, continuing to engage with uh, our contacts at the SEC and continue to evolve the thinking of both groups um, to reach a point where, um, again, the ISSB standards are ready for adoption by a regulatory body like SEC. Yeah, my own uh, take on this too, just coming from the consultant lens, is that nothing's too shocking. This is very much in line with what we've seen come out of the UK in terms of their own regulatory framework that has a high focus on climate risk. Ryan had mentioned earlier how there's joint implementation guides with, for instance, the TCFD recommendations, and I think that's going to become a really material way forward for a lot of businesses. We would expect SASB to continue to be able to be malleable and expandable to cover this climate risk as you need it uh, and be able to have that as part of your annual disclosures. So we're excited about this announcement too. Uh, it's, it's definitely going to be the trend moving forward and having just a little bit of structure behind what it is we need to know from companies is only going to be a positive. Completely agree with both uh, Ryan and Kylie. Uh, we were moderating a panel in San Francisco recently and some of the panelists mentioned that your own way of tracking and reporting this information was almost uh, what you would expect to see who is doing it right and getting out performance. Uh, so, um, but I'll say the majority is expecting for some sort of commonality, some rules, right? Just to make it simple, 
if we had a soccer match, if we're playing soccer and somebody grabs the ball with their hand and they run, run behind the court and they throw it in, that's not, not fun if we don't have rules of how we're going to engage around these topics, right? So I think it's welcome news. And just to let you know, this is, stay tuned for part two. This is definitely what we're going to be talking about, the context around regulations, both in the U.S. and abroad, uh, what we're seeing from uh, sovereign funds, um, different types of um, rules and regulations. And please note that they're usually come in phases, so nobody is getting, um, you know, kind of um, <laughs> penalized at the moment, uh, things usually get rolled out into phases, but you do want to start understanding how to control that story and how to track data. But yeah, great, great question. Very timely. Yeah. So I know you kind of touched on this a little bit, um, Kylie, but can you talk a little bit about if somebody doesn't have any data to start with, what, you know, how much do they need? How far should they go back? Should they research or should they just start at where they are? Have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd say the easiest way to jump in is to really align with the recommended disclosures of SASB. Don't get lost in the materiality map. Just start to look at what is reasonable for us to begin collecting. From there, you can say, do we have any ability to collect it this year? Is this something or is this a process we need to put in place moving forward? And then in one year's time, we'll have this information. Either are okay. Uh, it's just a matter of, of do you want to go through the effort of, of aggregating them all? You should be able to really uh, answer the qualitative portions, um, the ones that are describing things like what policies are in place, how much are they covering? Do you have an understanding of the, the operations that fall under this, for instance? So there is quite a bit that says we will help you align to right off the bat that you don't even have to think, oh, I'm collecting the data point and this is what it is. Um, so I would say that's likely the best way to jump in. Get you know into the habit of having that for a year or two and then really think, are we getting the value out of this? Are we understanding how this is tying into our bottom line? And does our investor understand what they need to about the ESG performance of our business? From there, that's when I would suggest broadening things a little bit. Okay. Thanks. All right, Ryan, I have a question for you. Um, somebody who is a non-accountant would like to know what the SASB certification or, you know, any kind of um, training would do for them um, across verticals. Is it, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a credential program called our Fundamentals of Sustainability Accounting. And so this is a two-part exam series um, to earn that at what we call our FSA credential. And the topics covered really sort of start with the sort of history and overview of the ESG reporting landscape, diving into the SASB standards, the structure, the format, and their standards setting process, and determination of materiality, um, sort of di really diving deeper into the topics that I discussed here. Um, and then it's really touching this, the for level, first level one starts to dive into corporate use and investor application. Um, so, and then the second level really uh, approaching this from a practical standpoint, an implementation standpoint, and going through case studies of how can the SASB standards impact your investing approach? How can it impact your ESG risk management approach? So we've seen groups from, we've seen professionals from all across the spectrum participate and take the FSA credential and succeed in the FSA credential and derive value from it, ranging from investors to sustainability professionals within uh, corporations, um, a wide range of uh, corporate professionals themselves who might have um, peripheral work with sustainability, um, legal counsels, uh, consultants, uh, and an increasing amount of accountants. So really just a wide range of uh, professionals and use cases and ways to learn from that fundamental, fundamental sustainability accounting or FSA credential. Okay. And um, somebody is asking a question. I know we might not know specifics yet because it's still being discussed, but is there any um, thoughts anybody has on what kind of the um, ramifications will be happening for small business if the SEC moves forward with um, requiring these kind of reporting? It's impossible to say right now in its current form until we have more details. What we have seen in other countries is that there is an associated tax penalty that is normally proportional to the size of the company. Um, but you're going to have so much planning and preparation and heads up for when this is rolling out exactly what's requiring that I wouldn't even worry about the penalties of, of not complying right now. I would more think through, okay, we know it's going to be focused on climate risk. What can we begin assessing at the moment about our practices? What can we begin collecting so that we're going to be really prepped for when more particular guidance comes out? 
I would yeah, say yes, starting, right? Just starting. Exactly. And if I if I can add to that, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission is really looking at securities issuers, right? So this is publicly traded companies, large organizations. So small businesses, I would say, may not see this for a few more years. And and really, by the time it gets to them, there should be a lot more solutions, a lot cheaper solutions once they're developed, once there's competition. Uh, so it should really be more of a kind of plug and play or off the shelf solution that they could utilize in, in the coming years. But for right now, it's really focused on um, you know, public, publicly traded companies. Okay. And someone asked a question about the Global 1200, the S&P Global 1200, um, and really what's the you know, ratio of what um, SASB, who are using the SASB framework and others? And so do you have any opinion on that, Ryan? Yeah, so right now we have about approaching 700 uh, companies within that S&P Global 1200 index reporting to the SASB standards, and that number continues to grow each year, and that really represents sort of a core benchmark for us in terms of tracking adoption. So we're really excited to have these large groups uh, reporting to the SASB standards because it represents just how much, um, you know, uh, how embedded the SASB standards are into their decision-making process into market infrastructure. And that group, of course, represents, you know, they're obviously a significant portion of those groups is, are US-based companies or North America-based companies, but significant amounts of those companies are based globally. And our work with, you know, we had a previous merger that I don't want to dive too much into because that gets another can of worms, but uh, creating the Value Reporting Foundation, merging with the um, Integrated Reporting uh, Council. And really, they've had a broad network of companies reporting to their framework, both in Europe, Asia, developing nations, so on and so forth. Um, and so that's been a really strong tool for us to increase that adoption across the globe. Okay. And um, have you noticed, um, what, Ryan, while we have you here, um, do you, have you noticed any trends in the last, let's say, two years um, of SANSB standards changing? Or, um, you know, when we were talking about you're open for input into the industry experts, can you talk about if there's anything shifted um, recently? Yeah, absolutely. And so we approach standard setting on a project by project basis. Um, so very focused on, on, on scope of these projects. So when we update the SASB standards, we're not entirely revamping the structure. We're not moving the amount of topics we're looking at. We're not changing the number of industries, but we're looking at very specific topics. We had um, our last project uh, affected changes in how we looked at tailings within the extractive sectors, um, as well as systemic risk within the asset management industry. Our next project that we're hoping to finish in uh, around May uh, looks at raw material sourcing. Uh, so again, really emphasizing these very specific and focused scopes. Um, and some of these have become very timely. You know, we started a project um, about a year and a half back or two years back on uh, content moderation within social media platforms, which uh, for better or for worse <laughs> has uh, become uh, quite relevant these days. Um, and so, and then of course with COVID, the implications there around human capital um, has been extremely drastic and sort of, you know, society shifting. And so uh, we try to keep abreast of these uh, shifting ESG issues as best we can, but recognizing that a vague and moving goalpost isn't beneficial to anybody. So striking that balance in the standard setting yeah. process and keeping up with trends, but doing so in a robust, strong governance, uh, transparent methodology so that people can follow along and provide their input as, as they see fit. Yeah, I would Great. say there is... Okay. Uh, in the low, oh, just one quick uh, comment on that. It's usually in the low single digits of percentage changes. So if you think of one, two, three percent right. changes every year, uh, which is really helpful, right? If you think about spending about eight years researching and coming up with these, you know, they're not going to be changed overnight. And so that's really part of the appeal for investors. They know what to expect. They know they, how involved this process was. Um, so yeah, just. Kind of thought um, to offer a couple of comments there. Yeah, that's great context, yeah. Carlos. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a couple other questions, but there's been a few people, and just in case people have to get ready for their next meeting, I just wanted to um, mention a lot of people have asked um, about the slides because they enjoyed the 
information and the content. And yes, those slides will be available after this um, event. And if we don't get to your question, um, we'll get an answer as well. So um, keep a lookout for the part two of this series. We'll answer one or two more questions before um, we go, but in case you had to run to another meeting, I want to make sure to let um, the few people that have asked, yes, there will, will be this recording and the slides will be available after. Okay, so people are asking about, and again, this is this is a hot topic. Um, does the SEC requirements? Does anyone know um, anything more about the penalties and or um, the effects that might be put on private companies? I, I would just say let's put this out of our minds for now. We're going to have so much more information come uh, in the coming year, two years, three years, and, and as Carlos had indicated. It, private companies are not going to be on the hook initially. So we promise you that things will have evolved at that point. There will probably be much better publicly available information for you to pull from when it comes to your specific climate impact. If you are really, really nervous about penalties, I would say the best thing you can do right now is talk to someone about what goes into a carbon footprint, what goes into the GHG accounting process, and just begin to think through what does my scope one, scope two, scope three even mean? These are very broad concepts. Concepts. We've actually done webinars in the past on some basics into GHG inventorying and reporting too. Um, so there's a lot of really good information out there, but we definitely all can take a deep breath. Regulation's coming. We know it's coming. It's not going to be things that that those of us in the ESG world haven't seen before. Uh, and you're going to have so so many resources at your disposal that don't even think about penalties. You're you're going to be able to disclose just fine. Okay, and I know that um, because people are interested in this, it just start 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 engaging with um, the information that SASB has available. Um, I'm a big fan of the um, engagement guide. I think it's um, really very simple to read, and you kind of get the essence of what's going on there. And you know, if if you're really interested, contact us. We'll, we'll help you. Um, you know, get started on the um, the other stuff that you're um, going to want to start measuring. So. <laughs> Um, with that, I'm going to thank everybody for um, your participation. Ryan, Carlos, Kylie, really appreciate the time. And we look forward to the second part of this series and um, everybody else for joining us. So everybody have a great day. Stay safe um, in between um, now and then. And we thank you for your time. Take care. Thank you, Jordan. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone. Cheers.